Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Amy Whitehead and Jenny Coe to the show. Amy and Jenny, welcome. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Ben. Really cool to have you on. Why don't we start where we always start? Let's get you introduced to the Sports Psych Show audience. And Amy, it's a question of reintroducing yourself because you've been on before. So, uh, Dr. Amy Whitehead, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm a reader or an associate professor at uh, Liverpool John Moores University in sports psychology and coaching. Um, also a sports psychologist and kind of working with a range of athletes and coaches. Awesome. And Jenny, it's been a long time coming. I'm really yes. delighted to have you on. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thanks so much, Dan. Uh, hard to follow Amy with the list of accolades that she has and titles, more letters. Um, so I'm working currently with the West Ham United Women's team as Head of Performance and Wellbeing. And I'm also doing some work uh, with um, different NGBs to do some coach development. Awesome. And you've collaborated on a new book entitled Myths of Sport Coaching. And that's what we're going we're gonna to talk about today um but i think to 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 get us started i mean amy um you've been on before it was episode 104 where we talked about the think aloud protocol how's everything going in the world of think aloud what's what's been going on any any updates anything new (laughs) yeah well what's not been going on but um, one of the big projects uh, that we're working on at the minute is um, through the British Psychology Society have funded us um, to run a two-year project to look at how sports psych practitioners uh, can use Think Aloud as an applied tool. Um, uh, so we delivered kind of some initial CPD, some workshops at the beginning of the year, and we're tr- now tracking a group of trained and um, HEPC sports psychologists and trainees to look at kind of where, how, and kind of any limitations associated with using ThinkAloud. So it's been really cool actually, because we've been able to see that ThinkAloud can be used throughout the sports site consultancy process. So as a needs analysis tool, as an intervention, and as a a, um, kind of assessment and measurement tool at the back end. So hopefully by the end of 2022, we'll have some kind of really nice resources, guidelines, um, CPD for, for sports like practitioners to use, which is quite quite nicely research informed. Well, we're here to talk about your book today, so I won't get you to sort of um, def- <laughs> define Think Aloud and, and, and reintroduce it to the audience. But what I will say is to everybody out there, go and listen to episode 104. I, I have directed so many coaches onto this episode and onto the Think Aloud protocol. If you're passionate about coaching, if you want to be a better coach, then utilizing Think Aloud is, is for me, such a, a pertinent way to do that. So, you know, just awesome work, Amy. Thanks so much for that. Thanks, Jenny, West Ham, women's team. How's that going? Did you start at the beginning of this season? Have you been there for, for some time? And, and how's it all going? Yeah, so last season I did a day a week just to kind of put my toe in the water, mm. see what the environment was like. Obviously, don't have a football background, but have been in, involved in sport at all levels for a really long time. And uh, they asked me to come on board in July full time. So, yeah, I took that leap. And, you know, it's just it's a representation of the direction that and the forward thinking that West Ham and the general manager has to bring somebody from, you know, a non-football space in as a head of performance and also extended um, with well-being in the title. So we keep it on the agenda. And that isn't just for the players, it's for the staff as well. So it's been an interesting um it's been an interesting few months. Uh, we've put some great processes in place. We're looking at language and behaviour. Um, it's evolving, um, but it's very exciting. The the connections that we're creating, a deeper understanding of of different areas of ourself, the environment we work in, each other. So um, yeah, really cool. Sounds to me like you found a bunch of um, open minded coaches, coaches willing to explore areas perhaps that they haven't explored before. 
yeah, spot on. Yeah, they. I think the idea of having somebody who is um, open, um, both from a coaching or performance support team, um, in in the world of football, is just it's really cool, and it's it's something that we are going on a journey together with. Um, so while we're navigating what works and what doesn't work, there's an open floor for people to share. So that's uh, that's our starting point, and the players have been really receptive as well. So uh, we've increased our female staff by five. Um, so we're, uh, we've introduced mindfulness on a daily basis and some of the other obviously core disciplines around analysis, sports psychology and um, the physical development nutrition. We're bringing more staff on. We've now introduced uh, a sleep expert into the fold as well. So, yeah, loads of cool things happening. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, no doubt, no doubt every staff member is going to be uh, getting a, a brand new crisp copy of your of your brand new book. Uh, myths of sport coaching um and what a, 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 i follow you both on on twitter and um saw that you started to uh put this out there about a month ago and um immediately the title hit me what a cool book myths of sport coaching because there are so many myths out there it's it's an edited book you've edited this book you've got a whole bunch of awesome contributors across the book um let's let's start with exploring the genesis of this book how how did i mean question to either of you um where did this start how did you start your collaboration here in terms of the book um andy from um the company yeah. Um, Andy Pert, he got in touch with me and um, I have to give him credit because it the t- actual title did originate from, from Andy. He got in touch and we discussed it um, because he asked kind of, you know, could, could we write a book on myths? And my first response was, well, I'm not an expert on all of these myths. Um, and I like, I, I wouldn't feel like we'd be doing it justice. So I kind of, I went to Jen um, and me and Jen have worked or uh, been friends for, for a while. We met through um, a Think Aloud workshop that I delivered when Jen worked um, at UK Coaching. Um, and I, Jen's always kind of my go to person for, you know, what's really happening in the world of coaching because Jen's constantly working with coaches every day. Um, and kind of went to Jen and said, you know, what what do, what are the myths that you come across on a daily basis with the coaches that you work with? Um, I can like come up with myths from an academic and research perspective. I do obviously work with coaches, but not as much as Jen. Um, and we wanted to come up with something that was, you know, going to be realistic to the everyday coach and something that the everyday coach would kind of maybe believe in or would question. Um, so then I went back to Andy and kind of just said, look, um, we'd really like to do an edited book and invite you know experts from all around the world who uh, research work and write in these areas and um, to, to write chapters for us um, and he was you know more than happy uh, for us to do that so I, I think then me and Jen got back together and then we were like right what are the main things chapters that that we think are important um, and again Jen I think you actually had a, a discussion with some of the coaches you, that you were working with at the time yeah, absolutely. Um, it was really interesting because I think the timing um, brought to the surface. So when when the the C word of COVID hit us, what did happen mm-hmm. in a beautiful way was people became really accessible virtually. And so a lot of the coaches were hopping on to a multitude of webinars um, in and out of their sport. And they were coming back and we were hosting these kind of virtual um, social learning spaces. But within that, I was kind of hearing whispers of different things. And I thought, "Mm, okay, I wonder how people are interpreting and contextualizing some of the stuff they're hearing. And and Amy and I in these conversations were saying, oh, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we just get them together and see if there's a a common list that we could um, go to our amazing network of people and see who'd who'd be passionate about sharing some of, of what they come across in their research. So between... Uh, even myself and Andy at Sequoia Books, we were able to kind of turn around and go, "Hey, okay, this is a this is an awesome list." I'm sure we could have gone on more, but we had to li- we had to limit it. And um, yeah, there's an incredible list of contributors um, in the book. Yeah, yeah, we 
we actually had to um we did have to curb curb it didn't we we kind of got a bit carried away we didn't expect the number of chapters <laughs> and we didn't expect to be some of the authors were like, can we have more words for our chapter? And we were like, no, the book's getting too big. <laughs> and I kept having to go back to Andy and say, like, you know, can, can we, add, can we have, add, have another 10,000 words? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was awesome. So your, your, your uh, brutal editing was, was put to the test. <laughs> it was tough. <laughs> uh, well, look, you, and I can I mean, you, you've compiled some fantastic contributors and there's so many great people around uh, who, who would be fantastic to, to contribute to a book like this but um, you've put together a, a fantastic selection of, of chapters and we're gonna we're gonna hone in on a few today and and, and unpack a, a few so so let's do so so we'll start with chapter five and chapter 10. And chapter five is entitled The Stepping Stone, challenging the myth that women's sport is less significant than men's sport. Um, and perhaps a close relation, chapter 10, they really are a different kettle of fish, myths surrounding the effective coaching of the female athlete. So we're very much talking about women's sport, female athletes here to start with. And quite pertinent, I believe, because women were banned 100 years ago from playing football. Would I be right in saying that, Amy? Yeah. Um, and is, yeah, it's really topical for, for this time. And Ali Boz, who writes that, who wrote that chapter, and um, quite rightly mentions how um, the FA kind of enforced a pitch ban right. in 1921 um, w- within women's football. So, yeah, very, very topical um, at this current time. That's uh, an, an extraordinary step to, to take. And I'd like to say that's you know how far far we've come, but it has been 100 years. And you would like to have th- thought that we would have, have come even further mm. in terms of uh, the development and the, and the promotion of, of women's sport. Um, uh, again, uh, a, a question to either uh, of, of you here. I mean, it, it's reading through this book and reading these chapters, it strikes me that you really wanted to uh, squash some of the, the myths around female athlete and, and women's sport. Um, so it strikes me that that was, Jenny, that was quite important to you. Yeah, it was. And I'm, I'm smiling here because it, it's linked to the, the opportunity for people to challenge where they currently are with their knowledge and the biases. But also um, what tended to happen was a, um, a broad pain stroke on coaching women, coaching females is different. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, straight away gives me an eyebrow raise because it, we're missing the person part of that. And in these two chapters, um, it really gets into the meat and the bones of who's the person and then what are the physiological considerations or what do I currently know? And if I am in a position from a coaching perspective and my team to be able to alter some programs and get to know the people. But underpinning all of that is how can we create an opportunity to be aware and communicate and put things on the agenda? So uh, in, in a really nice, fun way, I had some coaches come back to me mid last year saying, oh, I've been to a workshop of menstruation and I didn't know this did you know this and I said yeah I did but keep going I'm glad it's on the agenda now how do you bring that into your environment what kind of conversations are you having um but yeah I was I was worried and I think um chapter 10 does a great job with this around the kettle of fish concept of actually let's look at the person first and then look look at the coaching around that and the needs of the person um and yes yeah, so it's uh, it's a great approach to it can either of you unpack that a little bit more for me um, in terms of the myths surrounding effective coaching of the female athlete? Um, so you, you've talked about uh, looking uh, looking at this from an individual perspective, coaching the person in front of you, but within that, accepting or understanding that, that there might be physiological differences, that, that looking at this from a physiological perspective is also important. Um, yeah, can you just either of you unpack this for me a little bit more? So. I think we need to like take a step back in terms of and I think both chapters really explain this really well in terms of why we have these narratives that men and women are different and where does that come from so I think from a sociological perspective it's kind of how we viewed men and women over the you know hundreds of years um, and one of the key messages from both chapters is that 
you know, women were viewed as frail, as physically unable, and if they engage in physical activity, then it might damage their, you know, um, ability to have children. So that was kind of one key or uh, one limiting factor, I guess, for, for why men and women are viewed differently. And then you've got this idea that, um, you know, even fashion in the early 1900s restricted women from engaging in certain sports and then, Ali talks about how, you know, when gender specific schools, so, you know, women, um, female only schools started, then women were able to take part in some sports, but it was mainly kind of, I think, cricket, tennis and, and, and something else, which where they were able to move around in these like big skirts and, you know, uncomfortable shoes and thing, things like that. So if for hundreds and hundreds of years we've constantly viewed women as less able and um, physically frail and um, this like idea has been perpetuated over, over time and people still think like that so um, it's maybe an unconscious bias but um, uh, Luke and Zoe in their chapter talk about how you know coaches still will say you know women are a different kettle of fish um, but going back to what Jen's saying, well, actually, we should just be thinking, right, you know, women are individuals, as are men. You know, what are the differences between these individuals? And are we as coaches, like, creating these stereotypes by, through these, like, um, these beliefs that have developed o- over many, many years? And even things like, kind of deviating a little bit out of the chapters, but even things like sports science research, like we talk a lot in, in universities now about what what research are we teaching and are we aware that all this research is done on men by men? So all the sports science, um, you know, how we train people, how we give people nutrition, all of that kind of stuff is just based around one gender. So do we need to start becoming, it's just developing an awareness and trying to get coaches to become more aware of um, why we we view the world in this way or why we view gender in this way and can we try and change that and stop using these terminologies and, and treating people in these different ways that then keeps perpetuating the same kind of myth and the same thoughts around men and women are vastly different. Yeah, there is physiological differences, but, you know, there's physiological differences between men within the, the male gender. Um, so, yeah, Jen, I don't know if you want to jump in there. No, I mean, I'm just thinking of some numbers um, to look at the growth. And I know we, you briefly mentioned about um, kind of the development of this. We're looking at in football alone, three million um, female registered players. And um, like there's so many entry and exit points for them to enjoy the sport. And without deviating too far from our chapters, chapter two with Amanda and and Anna, they're talking about fun and sport. But a really nice line that they have there um, near the end of the chapter, which also provides coach recommendations, is how at a young age, um, the groups are divided up by the kind of salient uh, biological traits of age and, and sex. And um, I think that links in nicely to chapter five and chapter 10 and, and the whole idea of um, how how are we approaching the person and coaching uh, the person in front of us and the needs and coming away from the language and, and those kind of rigid narratives that maybe people just kind of roll into. So, yeah, there's it's um, yeah, it's really interesting. Considering or bringing into consideration any kind of ethical considerations, I mean, listening to listening to what you're saying here, uh, I'm thinking about the perception of the body. Um, I'm considering cultural norms or what could be considered cultural norms um, historically. Um, I have heard about the nature of research who has who has taken part in this research um and it it makes me think of the importance of critical thinking uh for the coach that they need to think critically about who is in front of them um and how they're going about their coaching practice and the processes within their coaching practice from an individual perspective and not perhaps drawing a generic broad brush 
viewpoint over um, or across genders, that they need to think critically towards the individual. Would I be hearing you correctly there? Yes, spot on. And so coming back to, you know, again, considering ethical communication here, um, is this is this still a, a huge problem in the world of sports, do you find? I mean, Jenny, in your day-to-day work, is this something, and, and, and again, with your ethical considerations, um, is this something that you're continuing to have to deal with uh, and manage and help people to understand and upskill and educate people in this area? Um, yes, is is the answer. But I think people are receptive. I think some some pieces of um, education that are drip fed in and not tried to you know weigh people down and intimidate, trying to maybe understand that there's multiple perspectives and the intent behind, from my perspective and my role, you know, trying to understand the intent of a comment or a conversation someone would make and how we can get to a point of um, having having some conversations on a regular basis and sharing some observations. And you mentioned reflection already, which is so vitally important. And what I found in the football world and, you know, obviously in the other sports I've been involved in, um, I can see it as well, this conveyor belt weekly game scenario. So we're going from one game into another and we're looking at training and competing and training and competing. So within that, we have shifted a little bit to look at our success measures. And in doing that, we can then pause as coaching uh, performance support team and players and reflect on what, what was success for me in that game? How did I approach it? What language did I use? Do I have my finger on the pulse of the room and the interactions and how a message landed? So um, the bigger picture of that is within the languages um, and and zooming out to, to coaches. Can we remove the female coach word? Can we remove female from in front of coaches? Can we remove the idea and concept that I'm coaching female athletes and I'm just coaching people who are really passionate about a sport? So the constant cries, for example, for Emma Hayes to take a job in the men's game, Is this a patronising message to women? I think it's really indicative of where so, the power of social media and and how and where they they would like things to go. I think, yes, you could look at it in one way and say, um, you know, they're trying to channel her in and they see it as a stepping stone. Now that you've completed X, Y and Z with Chelsea, you need, you need to go in this direction. And she said, well, actually, I'm really enjoying this experience. I feel nourished in this environment. And we are having an absolute ball (laughs) with what we're doing. And then you have the other side, which I think is maybe a little bit blurry for people, that maybe some of this push is excitement that the women's game is developing there. And um, the platform and the spotlight that's on it is allowing people to say, well, yeah, I think she could do that. So what, you know, (laughs) each to their own opinion on on where they think people should go, which is is where social media likes to direct us. But I think it's really exciting that it's it's on the cards, it's on the agenda. It's how we interpret it um, uh, is, is the interesting part for me. There seems to be this quite fascinating juxtaposition in as much as it strikes me that there's a lot of great work from a, a commercial and media perspective to promote the women's game, we're talking football, soccer here. And yet at the same time that Emma Hayes narrative, for example, and in the chapter in the book, um, they use an international manager, the authors use an international manager as an example, who perhaps in the media asserted the claim that this could be construed as a stepping stone towards the men's game. So there feels like this interesting juxtaposition here where there's so much good work going on, and yet at the same time there's some subtle undertones or even overtones that it's, oh, but it's still a stepping stone. And we're still not quite there in terms of asserting the message of, you know, this is this is men men and women on an equal footing here. This is these are these are highly skilled individuals engaged in 
soccer, football, basketball, baseball, whatever the sport, that we're still striving for that Alexa of equality. You know, the important message that you've um, you've, you've absolutely nailed there, Dan, is that um, while we're on this really cool trajectory and the, the sponsorship and spotlight that um, all the, the sponsors are giving to the sport is, is we need to be also mindful that it's amplifying certain things. And if we don't have the education underpinning that, both from a, a coach, coach development, mental health, well-being, sports psychology, all those areas, if we're not moving as a staff with that speed, then that is where the concern comes in. Um, and we want to celebrate the progress and we want to celebrate that there's 3 million female athletes or players, athletes, they're making my own mistake, um, registered in the country, striving to be the best version of themselves. How can we drip feed in the education so we can all move together? Mm. And going back to the comment you made, Dan, about the media, like the media has a huge responsibility or plays a huge part in, you know, how we level the playing field within sport and, and gender because, you know, even though the more people are watching female sport and more female sports being televised, it's nowhere near um, equal. Uh, and then you've got, you know, pay um, for... Uh, equal pay I think is it tennis has probably one of the most kind of equal pairs but that's only at the top level in grand slams and um, whereas if you look kind of at lower levels then it, it's very different and the sponsorship is different um, and then also like I, I don't I think this is a little bit outside the book but in terms of kind of how women are portrayed in the media um, compared to men and again it's very kind of sexualized um, and it, it then adds to this kind of element of, you know, sport is masculine, it's a place for men, created by men, um, and women are like, you know, these feminine individuals selling these, you know, nice clothes and, and um, products. And so, again, it's, it'd be interesting, and I'm sure people have done this, to, to study kind of adverts around with female and male athletes in around what are they advertising and does this then perpetuate this idea of um, you know the the gender uh, differences and and the masculinity element within within sport I've got two more questions um, on this side of things the, the the first one is for coaches listening in who are perhaps about to take a role or are in the early stages and, and and i'm probably directing this towards male coaches here um about to take a role or in the early stages of coaching um women's teams um and i think that chapter 10 is a good resource for them what what things what what approach is chapter 10 proclaiming that they should take? What factors should they consider rather than aligning themselves with this myth of that coaching female athletes, um, you're dealing with a different kettle of fish here. What considerations should they take? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first, the first thing um, which I know is entrenched in all the chapters of the book is is the relationship and the connection. So, um, if somebody is into coaching already and they're hearing this and they're thinking, well, how you know, how am I approaching this? If they're new in, as you're saying there, I think there's a really interesting angle to look and, and analyze the type of relationship that you have in your environment with your coaches and your and your athletes because that's underpinning it and when you're building trust the truth is coming out and then people feel they can be a little bit more candid and open when they go actually do you know what that comment that that's not necessary for me or that kind of affected me this way and you have these opportunities to connect but um I think there's the effectiveness of coaching tends to not have the opportunity to see the person as a woman or as an, a different kettle of fish or something that you have to brace yourself to and broach. That somebody is coming into your environment to be coached, they're enthusiastic. Um, again, going back to, to some of Amanda's work who did chapter two, she talks about the sway of social media that when you put in girls in sport and boys in sport, the images then dictate and to start to build that picture for us. Um, so we're kind of looking at um, an opportunity for people to 
engage in the ongoing process of observation, reflection, as we've said, the refinement of your practice and, you know, the opportunity from, you know, best coaching practice anyway. How, how, how many times are you hearing and feeling what's going on and what's landing with the learners that are in front of you? And Amy, you've mentioned research. What are the implications for researchers here? And what are the implications for the interpretation of research? Um, I've always, I suppose when it comes to sports psychology research, I've always questioned, well, who are you researching here? Predominantly, my work is at the elite level. So I've always cast a sceptical eye, not a cynical eye, but a sceptical eye, because research by and large, by and large, doesn't happen at the elite level because of the challenge of access to elite level players. Now we're talking about gender here. And what you've alluded to is, well, wait, hang on. We might say something has an underpinning, has underpinning scientific evidence, but who is this research? Is this study um, researching both male and female athletes? What's the implications for research? Are there any implications for research here, Amy? I think it goes back to kind of the, again, the history of, of sport in general. And I think research has followed us, research in sport has followed a similar kind of um, process or, or avenue. Um, in terms of you know sports science research was predominantly but it's very was very male oriented I'd, I'd, i say was but I, I still think it is more male to female oriented um and you know we we just pick up these research papers and we assume that they apply to the you know wider population when actually when you dig a little bit deeper the it is very you know male oriented um, even in like kids in, in, with science books when they're younger, like if we look at the, the skeleton or the muscular system, um, it's all ma- male bodies um, yeah. and that's starting to change and white bodies as well. Um, so again, it's not just a gender thing. It's also um, you know a race thing as well. But anyway, um, but I do think we are starting to become more aware of this. Um, I know at Liverpool John Moores University, we're doing a huge kind of push on EDI, making sure that when we teach research, we're looking more for, you know, mixed um, mixed research from male, females, and we're looking at intersexuality, stuff like that. Um, and we're making sure that we're trying to be representative. Um, I, another thing I was thinking about when you were asking me that question was hmm. psychology in general, we like to put people in boxes, right? Um, and I've been guilty of this myself. So, you know, I've done research comparing males and females in, in, in certain sports. But then these chapters have really got me thinking around, you know, why why are we looking at the differences between male, males and females? Like, is it important? And also, like, obviously it is, but should I be looking at individual differences more than gender differences? Um, and also it very much depends on our kind of philosophical lens of research in terms of, you know, do we take a positive perspective, positivist perspective where we want to, we want to put people in boxes and we want to generalize to populations or should we be taking more of an interpretivist perspective where we are really digging deep into kind of the individual differences, um, especially from a coach. If we're looking at coaching research, coaching is about the individual. It's about how we work with you know individuals how we communicate effectively how we develop like good coach athlete relationships and i think you know it's important that we we do appreciate different lenses given what you've just said then that was going to be my last question but i've got one more question um and i want to frame this on a slight from a, from a slightly personal note in terms of on this podcast i always mention or i often mention personality science and um, there's a great deal of skepticism around personality science because individual behavior is um, complex and context specific. I'm interested in personality science because I'm interested in human behavior and I'm interested in the notion that there may be typical responses 
um, around human behavior, that extroversion exists and introversion exists. Um, and yes, absolutely, context matters. Nobody would deny that, but there could well be, and there is 40 years of evidence to suggest that human beings do have typical responses. They have typical uh, behaviors. However, in my consultancy practice, I would always consult with the individual, the individual in front of me. That's the most important thing for me. And so I suppose my final question to both of you, if we relate this to attitude towards gender participation and progression and performance within sport is, is there room to study and or appreciate differences between gender and at the same time, from a consultancy perspective or coaching perspective, um, look more towards the individual? So there's a kind of, again, I'm going to use this word juxtaposition between, well, I'm still curious about gender differences and whether that exists, but whilst ex accepting from a coaching perspective that those differences don't matter so much, that it's the individual in front of me. I mean, what a question, Dan. My goodness. Um, as you were speaking there, I was, I was kind of dissecting um, the whole idea of personality around the behaviours that we might ex expect from somebody. Um, based on gender or age or the cognitions and emotional patterns. And again, I go back to the, the in, intent of the message and the education piece that parallels that. And I don't believe that, uh, well, in, I, uh, with my honest lens and positive lens, I don't believe that anybody's saying things um, with malicious intent. But if we look at the individual and the behaviours that the environment and kind of the biological makeup is, is affording us to interpret and the cognitions uh, based on how we're engaging and their own um, perception of the environment and the emotional patterns, I think then we can start to look at the individual and the collective and, and shape. Um, but um, yeah, it's a really, really interesting question. Let, let's, let's shift gears and let's dive deeper into the coaching, I suppose, coaching process, coaching practice. Let's dive into chapter eight, uh, written by Brendan Cropley, Sheldon Hampton, and Lee Bulldock. Coaching is a 24 hour a day job. Sometimes I think being a sports psychologist is a 24 hour a day job. Um, we're in and around the Christmas period. Um, and it's a time of joy and celebration with families as best we, we can do this year as, 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 as COVID is still happening. But look, I, I think it's fair to say that coaches tend to define themselves. If we, if, if we almost go to identity here, we tend to define ourselves as passionate about what we do. It's a jobby, right? It's a job and a hobby. And so subsequently, it can eat away at all of our time 24-7. Talk to me a little bit about this chapter here. I think it's such an important message. I really, really do. Can we unpack this a little bit to either of you? What I love about this chapter is um, for the last maybe two and a half weeks, almost every day I've heard, are you, are you winding down for Christmas? And I was like, <laughs> no, we're winding up. <laughs> We've got three we're games in one week, exactly. you know. Um, and I think what um, what the guys do at this chapter, the authors of this chapter, they open it with some of the, the terminology that's really familiar in a, in a quote. Uh, this job is never ending. I'm really passionate, as you said, Dan. Um, I can't be out of touch with my job. It's a 24-7 and a couple of pages into the chapter, then there's an, um, a nice reference, but an interesting one where we, I think all, you know, bodies and systems could look at the message that they send. And this one is around the IOC talking about it is a 24-7, 365 days a year, you know, job role. And if that's the mentality of the people employing and um, allocating people to roles, and then their competition structure isn't maybe doesn't have a depth of thought or maybe isn't diverse in that panel who are who are laying out the calendar then we're in this almost self-fulfilling prophecy for people to kind of own that role put the backpack on and go well sure I'm in now and the, the balance becomes blurry or the the jobby I absolutely love that term and um, so it becomes less of the nice to have and, and and more of the the need I need to do this I should do this all those terms and words and I think um, again in a number of different books I've read over the years 
there's this idea of um, when I'm saying yes to some or one thing, I'm saying no to something else. Dan Millen, Dan Millen says, choice means saying no to one thing so you can say yes to another. And I wonder, and I definitely have experienced on the ground, but I wonder with the listeners, I've um, who who is the person that's getting the no each time? Is it you, is it your family, is it your loved ones and those positive people that inject energy and uplift and stimulate? Are they the ones that are getting the no for the things that are the yes, the must-haves, the shoulds, all those others? Um, So this chapter is just an absolute golden chapter for people to dive into. Amy, your thoughts on this chapter? Yeah, I think, sorry to go back to gender again, but um, this concept of coaching being a 24-7 job could contribute to a reason why you know there's not many female coaches out there because you know like it's a huge sacrifice and and you know men also play a role as um caregiver parent and i'm not saying that all men um don't you know have to raise a family but i think you know um cultural social norms that that surround us mean that some females may feel like they have to choose between coaching and raising a family. And I know I know that kind of from experience with colleagues um, around having to um, drop certain um, coaching roles. Like in Norway, there's a study done where I think the average age of where women stop coaching was 29, and that correlates with when they start a family. So this idea of coaching being a 24-7 job and but is it is it a myth (laughs) and some of these you'll notice some of these chapters there are there's truth um uh, in in it so there's it's not always a hundred percent a myth but then obviously the authors go in and talk about the problems associated with that um and for me the role of the coach is so complex there's so many hats that they need to wear that this then leads to burnout um, and, you know, mental health issues for the coaches themselves. Um, so the, the concept of coaching being a 24-7 job is can be quite, well, very detrimental. And I think, again, it's the authors are making, uh, creating this awareness of coaches to hopefully read it and go, oh, you know what, what, what can we do to protect ourselves as, as coaches um, and what mechanisms can we put in place? Um, I remember in, I think it was 2018, I was in Tokyo at the um, ICC conference and a, a keynote speaker, I think it was a swim coach, got up on stage and he made a joke like, oh yeah, I've been up since four o'clock this morning because of the time difference and I had to be on Zoom with with my athletes and like it was all, that was meant to be a, a, you know, a funny thing, like look how, look how much I work. And I just sat there and I thought, isn't that sad that he hasn't got an assistant coach or colleagues that he can lean on that would mean that he can actually have a full night's sleep and enjoy the conference where he was there to learn and develop. Um, And that kind of perpetuates the idea that coaching is a 24 hour job and that's okay when it when it's not. In in my opinion. Uh, look and and uh, there's so much to unpack there it's such a fascinating landscape and and this chapter is fantastic in as much as it's rich in detail i mean brendan brendan cropley has been on the podcast before a huge fan of his work um across all areas that he you know whether it's reflective practice that he um talks about a lot or whether it's um welfare well-being player well-being and 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 actually i i I do believe early on in the chapter they talk about the authors talk about coaches performer and coaches don't always see that. You know, I'm a performer, so I have to take care of themselves. They kind of um, um, orient attention uh, towards the, the the performer themselves as performers rather than, hey, I don't define myself as a performer. And you just wonder if, if this, you know, we talked about a lot of the cultural, social aspects, the historical, cultural aspects of sports today already. And you just wonder if we've been socialized in sport into, especially at the elite level, the grind, 
it's all about the grind. It's all about the grind. We say this about athletes, much to my annoyance, as you've probably seen me talk a lot on Twitter about stop, stop talking about the grind. It's not the grind. Okay. It's about effective practice, but it's the same. We could take that notion of player practice and draw it upon a coach practice. It's about effective practice. So I wonder if we've been socialized into that because sport is so synonymous with this notion of grind and hard work. And it draws upon the question of, well, what are you doing for 20? 24 7 okay now i definitely overthink my 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 work i'm definitely always thinking about it and i have to be better at trying to get away from it because there's times where i suffer from neural fatigue where i'm so exhausted and there's definitely times where i do think well i'm exhausted now and right now would be a good time for me to be thinking about and working on a project but because i've been thinking about it all last night I'm now tired. So there's a counterproductive element here. And I, last thing, there's not going to be a question here, but I'd love to get any reflections you, you, you both have yourselves. But your story uh, from Tokyo there, Amy, thought of the one of the missing links here, maybe the collaborative piece that uh, perhaps sometimes, and perhaps head coaches can be guilty of this, they think they've got to work 24-7, so they siphon themselves off from the group, and they don't work as collaboratively perhaps as they should do. If you're blessed to be in a big organization and you have a team of staff, you have your, 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 your assistant coaches, but you also have a head of medical, a head of athletic performance, a sports scientist, and, and maybe even blimey maybe even a sports psychologist right then you've got this opportunity to collaborate and actually allow them or enable them to actually uh, do the, do the work essentially so um yeah again no no question but there's so many things popping up in my mind about this it's it's a rich chapter a- any thoughts back at me there my sorry Jen I'll let you jump in in a sec but my thoughts were and I was talking about elite sport here I guess but yeah there's so much accountability to with these coaches so if they're not getting medals then they're lose they're mm-hmm. potentially losing their jobs so then does it create this culture where we feel like we have to work 24 7 um to you know support our athletes to win their medals to keep our jobs and linking back to some of the other chapters on like 10,000 hours like theories or you know the idea that our athletes have to engage in so many hours of training does then that make coaches feel like they need to engage in that amount of coaching um to one you know maintain their livelihood um and and get these medals within their athletes well, that, that's just a thought. Jen? Yeah, so many thoughts there. I think I'll go back to the original um, entry into the chapter around the responsibilities that sports organisations have to provide the opportunity and the resources for coaches in this role. So it doesn't become, the many hats don't become intimidating so they don't coach at all, or they hit burnout, as we've mentioned, where the coach is feeling overwhelmed or emotionally depleted or negatively detached, as you alluded to there, Dan, as well. But there's also a bigger question um, and thought process around how to be that person so we talk a lot about the what and it's accessible everywhere you can google anything and find something but it's the how to make it yours how to do it so if a coach identifies yeah that's a signal that's something the book is interesting how do we transfer or or press pause and go gosh that is me or that's really interesting I think this is what we've tried to shape in each of the chapters with the authors is putting in some practical implications, putting in some suggestions in their own way, in their own words, but having that opportunity to break down some of the theory into digestible bite size. And so people can identify themselves or opportunities within the book. There is a section in this chapter as well that goes to mental health and well-being. And and by saying it's topical, I don't want to dilute that at all. But I, I do think that people shouldn't just take it and go oh yeah mental health well-being well actually what strategies are you putting in place and do you and Mm -hmm. you know if it's not the five ways to well-being that suit you and having a bath or going for a walk doesn't work for you then finding something that can allow you to be adaptive in the environment that you're in to to adapt your behaviors to survive and thrive in this complex world of coaching and there is an argument and I've probably been part of it in some social media debate at one point around the complex element but I, I do think that, you know, as we pull a, a little bit away from tech tech being the be all end all, 
then the complexity comes into understanding yourself and how you interact with others. And what you said earlier, Dan, there, and you've used the word a few times, and I just it just sparks me completely about effective, effective leadership, effective communication. Um, I could go on. <laughs> so effective questioning. Um, nice. So and the one of the self care practices that I tried to incorporate um, in the previous role I had as a coach developer across a number of different sports was new experiences. And I know from looking at a lot of your uh, work online, Dan, that we'd probably be aligned in our thinking around the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett and the neuroscience and the experience and the probability coming from, and, and it's the super simplistic angle for me, but the idea of experiencing new things and a new way of, mm-hmm. of living and not kind of going into the conveyor belt of the CPD being within your own sport or actually not pausing to have fun, new experiences that stimulate and, and broaden those opportunities to um, to have more knowledge around things and how you how you are present in those new environments. There's so much great stuff to um, reflect upon from what you've both said there, and I, I want to hone in on two things to finish off our assessment or our, our study of this chapter. Uh, something you said there, um, Amy, um, the expectations of the organisation we're talking elite here, the expectations of the organizations, perhaps on the head coach around results, around medals, around championships, around trophies, around winning games. And it makes me think of, of actually, is this, is this also, and not just the passion of the coach and perhaps the individual him or herself, um, perhaps misunderstanding what it is to be the best that they can be that we're trapped in this narrative this landscape of more is better but also a top-down communication challenge here in as much as the expectations are huge gold medal win the trophy win games um and so what that does perhaps philosophically for the coach is it becomes coach's hero it's this person is going to work 24 seven. This person is so dynamic coach as, as a hero. And Dr. Pippa Grange talks about this a lot. Um, doesn't she in terms of what well, I don't buy into that. This should be a collaborative effort here. There is no hero in this story here. There's just a, a head coach who is, who has a certain set of skills, who has to engage collaboratively across, um, other staff members with other skills and do we need to look at it do we need to is it flattening that here's that here it is is it flattening that hierarchy in order to um ease the pressure on head coaches so that that, that was a thought and, and maybe you'll to finish this off you'll have some thoughts on that and then something you said there jen which i, I loved you said lots of both of you said lots of stuff i love but something that hit, hit home for me is the google generation Anybody can now go in a split second and Google the what. It's not so much the what, it's the how. And the how smacks of we have to have a more nuanced understanding of optimal human functioning. And that's the coach as well as players. So we can get the what quite easily, but it's the how. And the how is more nuanced and more complex than simply, well, let's just work really hard. Um. So that's my rambles on that one. <laughs> I don't know if you want to, any any thoughts to close on this chapter here before we move on to the last one. Well, I think just one one thing around the how there is I, I don't see that, and I'd love if people could share with me how to be a head coach and how to be an assistant coach. And so what I'm referencing there, because I do think people could then say, but if you're just teaching and developing people, but I think there's certain expectations that come to each of those roles and then the progression of those roles and I guess the idea of how success can be achieved within those roles and and we've talked already about the measure of success but whilst we mention elite and the higher end of the pathway if we look at the the grassroots and the volunteer coaches that come in the responsibility is still the same you still have human beings in front of you that you want to work with and that are looking to be the best versions of themselves so if it's if it's not diving into the how and uh, them understanding what things mean to them and support a massive support structure along the way, you know, it could be detrimental. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Look, it would be remiss of me not to spend the last 
five to ten minutes um, exploring chapter 15 of of your book. Um, and that chapter is the evolving role of the sports psychologist and the myth that their sole role is to fix athletes. Um, so this one is close to my heart, um, being a sport, <laughs> sports psychologist. Uh, chapter authors are Laura Swettenham, Kristen McGinty, Minister, and Stuart Bicker. Fantastic chapter, breaking down what sports psychologists actually do and what they can actually offer. Big smile from you, Amy. Talk to me about this chapter. Well, um, we always get asked the exact question you've just asked there. What do sports psychologists <laughs> do? Um, and I think as a sports psychologist working in coaching, obviously I always get asked that question. Um, but this chapter came about through some the, some trainees that one one in particular I was supervising, um, and the other two um, qualified now, but um, were going through their training at the time. And they actually have taught me a lot about what sports psychology is over the last kind of three, four, five years because. Uh, and a lot of the discussions that we we have are, at, are around kind of what sports psychology originally was perceived as when I was training um, like 17 yep. years ago and what sports psychology is to them now. So, um, and, and I think when I first started working in sports psychology, I was kind of, I remember working for a football team and they were like, that player's injured, fix him. <laughs> and that, 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 that's the type of language that was used. And, you know, the coaches had said to the players, if there's anything wrong with you, go and see Amy. So we're creating this kind of idea that the sports psychologist role is to just fix people. You know, they've got a problem, let's stick a plaster on it um, and off they go and they'll be fine. But I think as we look at sports psychology now and, you know, the, the world is changing its perceptions of, of sports psychology and, and clubs and organisations are much more open to it, much more educated around the importance of it. Um, so Laura, Kristen and um, Stuart kind of talk about the, the role that they see for sports psychologists now around, you know, mental health literacy and, and linking back to the um, 24-7, you know, coaching role chapter, like sports psychologists are there also to support coaches to create a more healthy environment, not just for players, but for the coaches and for the staff that are in that environment. So I think it's more, more around how can we move away from this kind of reactive fix and culture to more of a, you know, embedding sports psychologists into organisations to help develop a more um, healthy environment for everyone. So, Jen, as, as somebody who um, is a coach, educator and developer, coach themselves, and somebody who's on the road to becoming a BASIS accredited uh, sports psychologist, uh, what does this chapter mean to you? Dan, it's a, it's such an important chapter. So I've spent my life in dressing rooms with different roles in, in the support role. So whether it was an athlete originally, a coach at international level, into the performance analysis route, which I was uh, accredited with the Irish Institute of Sport, and then trying to understand now in the role that I'm in as, as head of kind of the support team, how I can bring this together. And just on the back of what Amy said there, it's still seen in, from my experience the disciplines are still kind of seen as separate and we're trying to bring that sports science team together and the extended team we have our team has the kit woman's included in our conversation the, the media marketing is, is included in the conversation because what are you noticing and how can we be as informed as possible to then have the conversation with the coaching team not to segregate but to be all on the same path because one piece of information shared with another in in a really safe way can then add a bigger picture and we can we can be working together and it could combat the 24 7 people feeling like they have a heavy load so I think this chapter is vital for an integrated collaborative approach of a multidisciplinary team and for the language and provision and understanding education around sports psychologists within sport uh, to be to be understood and to be appreciated an integrated approach uh, of a multidisciplinary team um, absolutely um, being all in 
essentially, isn't it? It really is. And I, I just, yeah. um, I completely agree. And it, 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 it doesn't matter who you are within the organization. Um, for me, I'm, I suppose my lens of the world is slightly biased, but I think everything is biopsychosocially uh, influenced. I like to say driven. That's probably strong, a strong term, but certainly influenced. Um, and uh, brains and nervous systems make make the difference. And so be, having an all-in approach, I just think is, is so important. And coming back to your point, Amy, of, you know, uh, no matter the, the sporting field that you're involved in, things things evolve don't they um i i i think this is an interesting landscape i mean certainly over over the years um i i've felt the fatigue of of striving to explain look we're not we're not we're not sh- shrinks we're stretches uh we um you know we're not coming in i mean sometimes it is about fixing if that's the right term uh people or players or but the vast majority of the time this is about flourishing and thriving and striving to help people optimize uh, uh be the best that they they can possibly be uh, in their environment and in life in general i suppose i'm quite a greedy practitioner and consultant i i want the best of both worlds i think it's it's performance and well-being and i'm always keen to sort of say that on the performance side of things again it's not about fixing performance it's about um helping people thrive and flourish uh, you know in their performance whatever the role they that they have but those really go together don't they and it, and it strikes me that the modern day sports psychology consultant is very much looking at the lens of mental health, welfare, well-being as a forerunner to optimal performance. And that's very much the philosophy this chapter takes. Would I be right in sort of assuming that? Yeah, and I don't want anyone to think that kind of were or the, the authors are being negative towards kind of mental skills and kind of, you know, helping an athlete on a specific day with a specific problem to go and, you know, do perform the best they can um, because there is a place for that. Um, and a lot of psychologists operate in that way, but I think it's more around um, kind of adopting both, uh, like a, a fixing, um, yeah. fixing the athlete idea, but also um, a psychologically informed environment and culture within the club. Um, and again, it goes back to a lot of the things we've been talking about in this podcast and these chapters. It's all about the social, cultural norms and stereotypes that have uh, has kind of developed this idea of spot psychology. Um, you know, people would say to me, like, are you reading my mind? <laughs> like, have you got a sofa that I can lie on? And um, but half the time you stood on the side of the pitch having conversations with with players. It's you know it it's not traditional stereotypical kind of, and it's just changing these perceptions of sports psychology so that coaches, people making those decisions within these organisations, go, you know what, let's bring that person in and help. They can help us to psychologically inform um, the environment and, and just create this culture of. We're not here to fix. We're here to prevent the need for for fixing, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And the chapter does a very effective job of doing that. Let's close on this term, psychologically informed environment. You know what? What's wonderful about this chapter is there really is scant literature uh, in the sporting world on psychologically informed environments. I mean, it obviously stems from the homelessness services here in the UK. And I talk, when I in my own consultancy, I talk uh, to, to coaches and to audiences a lot about psychologically informed environment. But there's very little out there that actually educates coaches on this side of things. But it sounds to me, Jen, you know, to, to, to close things here, it sounds to me, Jen, like really the overarching philosophy that you're taking at West Ham women's team is um, let's build a psychologically informed environment here. Would that be the uh, correct take on what you're doing there? Yes. Clench his fist and waves them in the air. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, um, go, going back to the idea of me being invited to come into a full-time role um, with well-being on the agenda mm-hmm. from a non-football environment, I did take uh, <laughs> the privilege um, of asking the why question quite a lot. Why are we doing what we're doing 
um, even if it's in practice design and there's a little bit of knowledge on how to how to constrain different things that we do and then reactions that we might perceive to be a certain way I'll ask the why what did they notice how did it go and then we can drip feed through the regular interactions pieces of information in and it, I think from a, a psychology point of view um, part of that is then signposting as well as being integrated and informing the practice so so the coaching team don't have to feel weighed down with anything that's going on and they have the sole responsibility of being the physical conditioning person, the technical and tactical experts, the psychologist, that now we have a wider team that's informing. But also there's this idea down there from a, a player perspective that they feel empowered and we're not enabling certain behaviours and ways of operating, that they feel empowered to understand and ask the questions and feel comfortable to ask those questions um, as they navigate kind of different emotions and regulate different stages of their performance. So, the, so that alignment and that, I mean, it, it, you know, it sounds utopian here, but <laughs> and it is a work in progress, but that's the ambition, yeah, to have that kind of psychologically informed environment. Fantastic. Now, um, I think this is a book I, I really love. I think it's a book uh, everybody in sport should buy. It, it can challenge uh, the, the lens that coaches uh, see their coaching by. It's certainly a couple of chapters challenge my lens, particularly the um, motor development one. I enjoyed reading that and, and, and seeing the world through different eyes. So, And that's important. That's vital to, to engage in that kind of critical thinking. And I think when a book does that, that that's the sign of a great book. Um, and given that you're both editors, uh, you you uh, can give yourselves permission to promote the book because you're promoting the authors as well. So you don't have to be too self-effacing here. So why should people buy this book for Christmas? Why is this such an essential read for them? I think when people think about why they're coaching in the first place, um, this book can be a great compliment. I think it's something that allows people to, to pick and choose different chapters that may be relevant now or in the future for them to challenge some of the ways that they've interpreted information formally and informally along their journey and to be able to really get an underpinning of some of the stuff that maybe for a few years they've been doing the same way or they haven't been challenged through no fault of their own. Maybe they don't have a support network or, um, uh, yeah, so I, I think there's, you know, we're looking at world leading global experts in these areas that have brought their research to the forefront and what they hear on a regular basis. So it's a great guide and it's a great, um, it, it feels good as well. I think that's really important from all the books that I read. Uh, uh, in the unboxing part um, of the video during the week, I picked it up and I felt, oh, this is good for a tube read. This is good for a train read. <laughs> For coaches who are on the go um, or people who are thinking of being involved in coaching, I think it's great to be able to pick up and um, pick up and drop as you go. Yes. Yeah, and I think we've tried to make it kind of readable um, to, to the wider population, but keeping it kind of research informed and, and academic at the same time. Um, but Jen's right, like just I, I reread some chapters last night, knowing that we were like coming on here today and yeah, I don't know, it made me smile just thinking like some of these chapters are so like easy to read, but you, you kind of, you're at the end of the chapter before you've even realised it, whereas I think, you know, some books that are a bit too academic can be quite heavy and you're having to like reread certain pages and certain words and we don't want that and um, we want it to be accessible to, to anybody. And I'm, I'm really excited to t like to hear my family's views because they're always you know, arguing with me and debating with me about different areas and concepts within sport psychology, sport coaching. And I think um, like my brother's a rugby coach, but he's not, you know, he's not been to university. And, and sometimes we have arguments over language and terminology and why do, why do we have to use such language in academia? And I think the authors have all made a, a really good job to make it kind of transferable and readable to the wider population. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. And it sounds like there's uh, room for a sequel, uh, Myths of Sport Coaching 2. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, that's, that's brilliant. Um, final question for you both. You will definitely have tapped the interest of the Sports Hike Show audience. So how can, I know you both use social media, how can people follow you on social media? Uh, how could they get in contact if you'd like them to get in contact? And the most important thing, how can they purchase this book? Um, so they can get in touch with me uh, on Twitter via a underscore whitehead one. 
Um, and they can also buy the book via the um, Sequoia um, webpage. And there's currently a 20% off code, Myth20. Um, and it's also on Amazon and Waterstones. Um, but currently, before this, well, this, it depends when this podcast's out and uh, when they order. But yeah, there's a currently a 20% off for, for Christmas. Yep. You can find me on Twitter. I uh, kept my playing number all through my playing career and then still into my Twitter. So that's very helpful at Jenny Cody 10 and on LinkedIn. And then um, I think, or email if people want to have an email or a good old chat, Jenny Cody at gmail.com. But the, um, yeah, uh, hop onto the publisher's website at Sequoia Books and Amazon and Waterstones and you can get some there. Awesome. And you can get a discount. Well, let, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with you both. That's been absolutely awesome. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Well, everybody, I just loved that podcast episode. It was absolutely awesome, absolutely fascinating. And I'd love to hear what you, the listener, thinks. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Site Show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.